My pleasure today to invite uh, Aileen Boundy to uh, talk to us. And um, Aileen and I have known each other uh, for more than five years. And um, Aileen has an incredibly interesting story, and um, the work that she does is extremely useful for this time, for what we're doing, what we're dealing with. And the main focus that um, Aileen, I'm hoping, will actually talk to us about today um, is the issues around addiction. Now, we've just been talking off camera um, beforehand and um, she was saying, well, the big problem that people have is actually identifying that they are in an addictive space. And I'm sure Aileen will, will go into this and actually um, be, a, you know, be able to actually help us identify the addictions that are occurring at the moment. And the particular addictions that keep coming up time and time again within these interviews are the addictions to idea sets. So these are things that come from, say, social media or from the government or from our culture in general. So uh, we become extremely addicted to these things. And um, I'm going to stop talking and let Aileen talk, but I just, I'm going to welcome you, Aileen, and just thanks, thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you, Neil. It's lovely to... Um to be talking to you again yes uh, it's been a while but it, we, 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 we did do a lot of uh, work together a few years back um, yeah the, the thing about addiction is that unless you recognize that you're actually um, indulging in addictive behavior whatever that is then you can't really make any changes I mean um, at the at the moment we're talking about being addicted to what the news tells us or uh, you know what the news on social media tells us um, and I think ev behind that impetus there's also an impetus that there's always an impetus of fear you know that uh, there's a great fear here and I don't know what to do oh well the news is going to tell me so I'm going to watch it because they'll tell me what to do it's that great unknown isn't it um, but then once you start to watch that and I don't know about in your country, but in, in my country, the um, the news is it's on every day at the same time. There's a bulletin about the current situation with updates from the government, etc., and medical experts. And it's very, very um, easy and quite an, uh, attractive. Is the wrong word, but it it fills a need for a lot of people to get the. Um, the information that they want and the um, reassurance that they want that, you know, it's all going to be okay eventually. You know, I, I just need to keep doing what they're telling me. And, um, and, and that, can, that can sort of play out in lots of different ways. Um, drawing on my own experience in, in recovery from um, alcoholism, I would say that it's uh, the first step is to recognize it, that you've, you've got the problem that you've you've got an addiction and um you, you know it, it, that will happen at different times for different people everybody's you know on their own different on their own path um i think as far as um the first step i guess the first step for most people would be able to would be to be able to um recognize it and think is this healthy is this a good idea for me what can I do about it? Um, and from then, you know, then you, well, 
as we're all kind of isolated in our own homes these days, most of the, well, most of the world is anyhow, um, what can you do? It, it's very limiting as well. And, and the, um, I, I guess the impetus is just to, to go over and switch the television on when you've got nothing else to do, you're a bit bored. Oh, let's find out what the latest updates are. And it's very easy then, from, from my perspective, I, I, even I can go quite quickly into fear and, oh, what if? You know, what if I went out and touched something I shouldn't touch? And what? And I have to stop that. So I have to switch it off. Go wash my hands, of course. You know, we'll do all the practical things as well. Um, and then my personal way of dealing with that is to go inside myself, is to sit, take even just take a few deep breaths, connect with my, um, you know, higher self, my higher power, whatever you want to call, you know, that intuitive sense that you have inside you that will always guide you and just sort of sit there for a bit um, and ask for help ask whichever um, whatever you believe in ask it for help whether that be you know uh, for me it's not a religious god it's something more spiritual and um, for lots of people it can be something to do with nature uh, but we all have that little voice inside that it's, it's our intuition. It tells us what, you know, what's right and what's wrong for us. It tells me in very bodily ways. I can get, you know, I, I can feel sick if I, if I start to, I can feel quite nauseous if I start to um, uh, sort of indulge myself too much and, and following this media. Uh, and then, you know, I might get a phone call from a friend who's just seen something and that will also, you know, stoke the fire if you like. And it's quite hard to, I'm finding it quite difficult to, to keep my center because everyone's focus is on this, um, on, on this virus and what's happening and how little we know about it. And then of course, we, we look to, you know, the authorities to sort it out for us. Oh, well, they say this, so we should do that. And, you know, I, I accept there's some truth in that, um, but, you know, there are different levels of uh, understanding of that, I think. Oh, fair enough. But one of, one of the really interesting things that you really opened up with here, uh, when you, you're looking at a thing like um, alcohol, so an addiction to alcohol, uh, everybody understands alcohol is a chemical and it has a chemical effect on the body and the body changes the way that it operates in relationship to it. Um, what people might not realize who are watching this is that fear is a chemical based thing as well. So like there's very specific chemistry uh, going in, on inside the body mm -hmm. and that chemistry itself is the addictive process. So this, this business of being addicted to fear is, is very potent, is very, very powerful. And um, my, my next question to you is actually um, to have a, uh, if you could just sort of guide us through um, your understanding around the ways in which we would use that addiction to actually distract ourselves. Well, it's uh, any addiction is um, it's, it's quite simple when it comes down to it. I don't feel good. So, you know, I need something to make me feel better. Whether that's, you know, a glass of wine, a bottle of beer, um, or watching the television because I think they know what they're talking about. Um, it's, that's how it starts. And the immediate effect is a sort of um, feeling better, an, an initial feeling better physically. Um, but then what happens over time, as I'm sure everyone knows, is that you need more of the addictive substance to achieve the same level of feeling okay. Uh, and quite where we step over the, that you know, invisible line Nobody really knows, but at some point, you know, as far as, uh, as, far as alcohol goes, the best way <laughs> I've ever heard it described is you can, turn, um, you can turn a cucumber into a pickle, but you can't turn a pickle into a cucumber. So once it's, once it's gone over the line, you know, um, it's, over. Yeah. it's over. You can't go back to not being an alcoholic. Uh, yeah. you, can be, you can arrest it, you know, by uh, stopping drinking one day at a time, um, as I do, but you can't go, you know, you can't go back there. And so um, then you, you need your fix. You need a fix of 
whatever it happens to be, um, you know, in the current situation, it would be, oh, well, I've got to watch the news at five o'clock or six o'clock. And you would start, to, if you didn't, or if, let's say there was a power cut, you know, you're unable through no fault of your own to watch this news to get your fix, which is what it is, mm. um, then, you know, you'll start to experience withdrawal symptoms. I mean, that's perhaps a bit extreme initially, but, you know, that's what it, that's what it amounts to. So the, uh, you're not getting what you feel you need um, to, make, to make that shift in how you actually are feeling. Uh, to make you feel better. I think that's how it works. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, it's, you know, I don't want to diminish the marvellous work that you've done for yourself and other people that you are uh, working with. So um, Aileen does a lot of work with other people who are recovering alcoholics. And um, so I'm not, I'm not meaning to diminish, you know, the potency of what you're doing there. But the difficulty that I see with this addiction to fear and the addiction to all of the um, other issues. So it might be um, anxiety or it might be panic um, that people are really becoming addicted to. Or, you know, like there's been a tendency probably in their lives all along and along comes this coronavirus and all the response to it. And it's a, it's a heaven sent fix. It's a heaven sent opportunity to really indulge in what, what you're dealing with. My, my question um, is that the um you know the situation with um alcohol it's obvious you make a decision that you know today i'm not going to have a drink at this moment i'm not i'm not going to have a drink how does somebody actually say um i make the decision not to be fearful or is it rather that they actually say i'm i'm only going to watch one bulletin of news a day or, or mm. what they do how, how do they actually manage that because it's mm. not as though you're having a drink but somehow you've actually got right. to stop the consumption. Yes, yeah. Uh, good question, yes. Well, yeah, for me it would be uh, I'm not going to watch the news or it depend, you know, how much are you watch, is the person watching. Personally, I've stopped watching it regularly. You know, I did in, in the first week or so and then I just found this is ridiculous. Uh, I'm not going to put my... Why would I put myself through this? Because I was sitting watching maybe an hour, 45 minutes of this every day. I think at the end, just feeling more informed. That's one thing, more informed because they had, you know, the medical experts on along with the government uh, spokespeople, um, spokespersons, spokespeople, <laughs> whatever. Um, but I also felt really depressed and down at every and. It took it took a few days before I, I, I why am I doing this to myself? So I actually stopped watching it at all. Now I occasionally watch it, um, but not you know not um, nothing regular at all, and and maybe only for the headlines, or I'll just choose to find them elsewhere. I can find the other in, the information online, you know, uh, where I've got a bit more control. Yeah. At, well, <laughs> relatively speaking, over what I'm reading. So I, it's, yeah, to, to try to say, well, how do I stop feeling fearful when I feel fearful? That's the only, the only way I, can, um, I could address that would be to say, don't resist it. And this is a quite a difficult thing to do for people, especially if they're, you know, isolated and they have no support. But if you don't resist it, because normally we feel fear and we fight against it. We don't want to feel it. So we go and get that the drink or we watch the telly or whatever. If we, um, if we manage to sit with it and allow it to come, most of the time it's not as bad as we anticipated it would be. Okay. All right. So it's almost the fear of the fear that's the, the yeah. first thing to actually um, be working with. If you, actually, if you actually allow yourself to sit quite, and you know, it, if you've been involved in some sort of meditative practice, um, that will help. But you don't have to be an experienced meditator to do this. It just, it's just a question of sitting, taking a few deep breaths, obviously, to calm yourself, center yourself, and then just try to ask, you know, where is this coming from? Why am I feeling this? Oh, and it might trigger other, you know, memories, obviously. And I'm not... Um, a counsellor as such, so this is not, you know, a sort of, uh, this is just my personal experience I'm relating here. Yeah. Um, but I've found that this does work. If I let myself go where I, where I was afraid to go, 
it usually is not as bad as I had thought it would be. Okay. One, one of the things that I'm aware of as you're talking about this, you just mentioned the, um, you know, the sort of feeling of depression that, that you, are, you experienced yourself. And mm -hmm. clinically, you know, in, in my clinical practice, I observe uh, a common cycle. And, you know, for those first three or four weeks for most people, um, as the pandemic is really, you know, biting, they were in something akin to man, uh, mania. So, like, it was a, a subclinical manic experience. So, like, they just want more and more and more information and they're manically mm -hmm. actually consuming. It's just mm -hmm. an, an absolute manic behaviour. And uh, But it's all fear-driven. So, the fear is sitting inside of that, the, the compulsion, you know, to have all that manic experience. And eventually, and this is an inevitable consequence of, um, you know, what I see clinically is that people get to a point where they become overwhelmed with all of that and they become depressed. They, they slow right down. And, you know, that, that feeling that you're talking about, you can see how those things sink in. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. direct, you know, causal process. Mm -hmm. And um, at some point, people will jump out of that and they'll just say, I've got to get control again, and they'll be anxious. It'll be something along the lines of, of anxiety that will actually be operating. And uh, we're, we're talking about subclinical things, and you know, I'm not meaning to diagnose people, but that trend around what's um, you know happening and how people are responding, but all of it's addictive. So mm -hmm. if, every one of those things and um, are are addictive, and um, you know, by goodness, you know, I can see clients for many many times, and they'll hold addictively on to. Um, any one or all of these these sorts of experiences and just what I'm viewing at the moment which is why I'm so interested to hear your opinions and what you're experiencing is that this is, is become exceptionally addictive with what's going on with us because of the global nature of mm -hmm. sequencing it's as though everybody's in parallel and in parallel they're all going through uh, through this experience so anyway look I'd just be very interested and your take on what I'm saying, and you're welcome to disagree with me. Um. Yeah, no, no, it, it is, right. I think one aspect of that, which you know, rings true for me, is that, yes, it's global, it's a pandemic, it's global, we're all, you know, you can look at it two ways, we're all in this together, or we're all, you know, suffering under it together. But one of the um, uh, negative aspects for me of, you know, the fact that we can all connect uh, which, you know, for so many people is a, a saviour at the minute that, you know, we can, mm -hmm. we do have the internet and we can connect. But one of the negative aspects of that is that we are also, um, we can also access what's happening in different parts of the world. And, you know, we can learn about other, um, you know, other responses to what's going on, which, you know, differ in different countries. I don't mm -hmm. mean the, the official, um, you know, way of dealing with it, although that's part of it. But, you know, ordinary people's reactions to it. And why that there is a commonality, uh, you know, to a lot of the experience, there are also, you know, different things. And it's, it's, it's overwhelm, isn't it? I find it overwhelming that you, you think, oh, my, oh, I never thought of that. Oh, well, um, maybe I could try that, you know, or isn't it terrible that this is happening in such and such a country? And you can get completely caught up in that as well especially if you have family members you know el elsewhere around the world uh you know comparing how they are dealing with it and what they're going through um you know i think all of us want to try and support you know our loved ones and and whoever we can through this um i have to say that you know for me um having been through a 12-step program that has been hugely helpful for me because it can be applied to this as well so yeah. you can yeah. you know you can in a sense you know if you've got a, a bit of um you've got a, a bit of sobriety under your belt you're already used to responding uh to whatever happens to any kind of change you know by using the steps as a kind of a framework and so i find that really helpful um you know and and then and, but the main bit for me that is so helpful is the spiritual aspect of it, which, you know, um, helps me to connect to something bigger and put things into perspective and, um, you know, make things feel right sized and to a certain extent, take away the fear. Yeah. For me, anyhow. 
just just for people um, watching this, um, what Aileen's talking about are the 12 steps that are a part of the program um, that has been used successfully for decades, many decades, in fact, um, by alcoholics. Yeah. Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, it's a, an absolutely breathtakingly beautiful and successful uh, program. And um, Aileen, I wonder if you could actually, as much as you're you know, comfortable to do so, if you could just mm -hmm. speak a little bit about what the steps are, and um, people can then actually realise that they can actually apply it to what they're doing, you know, what they're experiencing. Sure, yeah. Um, well, the first step, uh, let me just find it here. Get them right. <laughs> First step is we admitted we were powerless over whatever it was, alcohol in this case, that our lives had become unmanageable. So it's that, it's what I was talking about initially. Yeah. That, we're, you know, I give in basically. I'm powerless. I have no control over this. And that's one of the main precepts. You know, we, we have no control over people, places, and things. The only thing we can control is our own response to it. And because of that, you know, we have to become responsible for our own actions. Um, that's my sort of little interpretation of it. The second, I know you're going to come in on that. <laughs> Do you want to come in now? No, no, no. Second, second step is came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Now that a lot of people, you know, they balk at that. They think, oh, gosh, you know, I don't believe in God. You don't have to believe in God. You don't have to believe in anything religious. Um, my belief is not religious particularly. It's, as I said, more spiritual. But I know that I have a personal connection with my higher power. It's, um, I don't have a name for it. I just know that it's, it's there looking after me. And I can communicate with it. You know, uh, I have this little thing, ABC, always be connected. Uh, the, the connection is always coming to me. It's always open that way. It's me that cuts it off, you know, through fear or um, other things. Uh, the third one is uh, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. And those last four words are really important to me and to make it a, a universally, you know, applicable thing. When it was written in the 30s, in the 1930s, it, it was, you know, um, much more of a religious uh, um, interpretation, I think, for most people. Um, so that is, you know, that you don't have to fix everything. I, I personally don't have to fix everything. If, if something's too difficult and I'm too upset about something, I can hand it over. And I get a sense of relief immediately, you know, when I do that. Um, Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And five, admitted to God, to ourselves, to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. So it's basically about taking a personal inventory, your life up to this point. Um, it involves writing down everything that's happened in my life that I've got, you know, um, a resentment about, that I've, uh, that I've, when I feel somebody's wronged me, um, Every, everything throughout, you know, throughout my life with, with lists and lists of people and uh, situations and so on. And then um, turning it around and saying, well, what was my part in that? So becoming responsible, taking responsibility for my own actions. Because it's very easy, um, you know, to point the finger elsewhere and say, well, if I hadn't had a boss like that, he makes me drink or, you know, <laughs> a partner like that, they make me drink. But um, it's more about looking at, nobody actually poured the drink, here I am with it, this is water by the way. <laughs> nobody actually poured the drink down my throat, I did it myself. Mm. And so it's, it's accepting the responsibility um, at that point. And, um, Moving on, it's um, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character and humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. That's, again, handing it over in a sense and saying, you know, please help. Um, made a list of all persons we'd harmed, became willing to make amends to them all. So we go through and we think of, you know, who, who do we need to apologise to? Sure. Who have we harmed? Um, and... 
made direct amends to such people that we could, except when to do so would injure them or others. So we go ahead and when it's right, we can, you know, we can make our amends and that, might, that will take years. It's not all going to be over in, you know, a couple of weeks. And then uh, 10 is continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So we've done all this work, we've made a list with, um, you know, we've acted on it. And then as we go through that and for the rest of our lives, we go, we are now more aware of how we act in, in different ways. And so we can, um, we, well, I can I personally pick it, pick it up more quickly when I'm kind of falling into old behavior. I can I can recognize it like like I do now with you know the television and the addictive nature of the news bulletins. I, I recognize it. I might indulge in it for a little while, but I can stop it and say, right, this is not the healthiest thing for me to do at the moment. Um, and then step eleven is a sort through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him. So it's whatever my personal you know my concept of my higher power is praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out so it's a sense uh, and of course that you know it doesn't have to stay there my understanding my concept of my own um, link with the divine has uh, evolved over the years and has changed quite a lot um, but you know th this is the this is the starting point and then the last one is step 12 is having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to um, alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. So it's, you know, moving forward and yeah. passing the message on, um, helping others, being there when someone needs help and uh, that sort of thing. Well, thank, thank you so much for um, sharing that with us. And, um, you know, I can only think that, that those steps would be useful for everybody. They would mm -hmm. be useful yeah, for everybody. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if you if you were to if you were to Google it, I'm I'm sure I've seen over the years various you know adaptations of them for mm -hmm. people who you know who who aren't alcoholics. Obviously, they they've been used for narcotics anonymous, uh, you know, narcotics anonymous, uh, overeaters anonymous, uh, all, all sorts of um, you know twelve step programs. Uh, they've been adapted but i've also seen you know more um sort of lay versions of them as well which you know have a look why not <laughs> absolutely and you know what I, I can't remember which number it was but um that notion that you take it forward out into you know the community and you you know you spread you spread this, this 12, uh, yeah. opportunity to to wake up you know, fundamentally and take responsibility for yourself. Mm. So, um, you know, the message of the summit is hugely connected to, you know, to what you've been doing, you know, doing there with it. So, um, I, you know, I definitely would recommend um, to people these psychological addictions that we're talking about at the moment that we're really addressing here in this talk, um, you know, to have an approach along the lines of the 12-step approach would, you know, could only yield wonderful benefits for people. Mm -hmm. I, I would just like you, Aileen, just to talk a little bit about um, the benefits of actually having a community. So one, one of the things that happens in, in the Alcoholics Anonymous is that you go and meet with other folk and, um, you know, share and support um, one another in, in their own journey. So still everybody's responsible for themselves, but there's a, a wonderful opportunity for community. And uh, I wonder if you could just sort of talk through a little bit of that. Yeah, sure. Well, it's, you know, it's an integral part of um, what recovery is for me anyhow. Um, and for anybody else involved in the, in, in AA, that we do have, um, you know, we have, the, the, it's, it's a fellowship and we call it a fellowship, the community, the fellowship of AA. And, you know, we have the, um, we have the opportunity to, to meet with people locally, uh, you know, as many times a week as we need, depending on, you know, how many meetings there are, but they're pretty prevalent all over the place. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the last, um, I don't know, six, five, six weeks or so, uh, many of us have gone online. We, we, I, I use this same platform for, for our local meetings. And, you know, that's brought its own, um, 
challenges and uh, issues with anonymity, of course, and with um, just keeping people safe. Because what we what we have in the in the physical in the face to face meetings is a safe space where anybody can come and share what they're going through, and they will they know they will not be judged. They will only be supported. Uh, nobody offers advice. It's people will suggest things now suggestions in the, in the sense of you know that the famous one you know if you um if you're gonna jump out of a plane we suggest you pull the parachute that kind of thing and you know i'm laughing about it but we are dealing with a life and death situation with alcoholism um sadly and um so you know there's an awful lot of support and a lot of people um who just come along for the first time don't understand why People are there who've, you know, been sober for five, 10, 20, 30 years. Why, why would you, why do you need to come, you know? <laughs> um, and there are two reasons, really. One is, you know, what we just covered in, in step 12, a, a responsibility that we feel having gained so much uh, to be able to give something back. And the second one is that we still need the meetings. We need people. We need the support of others to, um, to speak to others who com who completely understand us in a way other people don't who don't have this um this is this issue so yeah. um yeah it's it's very uh i mean it's not always fun it's not it doesn't always you know it's not always that positive um in that you know that there can be challenges there are people in in extreme situations who are very very fearful um, there are often quite big personalities around, but you know, overall, because of the, I was going to say, I was going to say because of the structure of it, there's actually very little structure. It's quite anarchic, um, the structure of AA, in that there is a structure to the meetings, and but all of the um, kind of posts of responsibility rotate, so you don't get people, you know, thinking, oh well, I'm the, there's no guru, you know, we're all the same. And it, and you know, other people will keep you in check if you get out of line, but gently, you know, and with love. Um, so there is, uh, it's fantastic support, and people, you know, who do take on different roles, they do it out of love and because they want to give back something that you know to say thank you for their own, you know, journey, their own path of, of yep. recovery, really. Yes. Well, you know, the picture that you're painting is like a utopia. It's, it would be, it's absolutely a utopia of, of people caring for themselves and in so doing caring for one another. And, um, you know, you're, the way you're describing it is absolutely marvellous. So you had a magic wand. What changes would you install in the community in general, you know, given, given this wisdom that you're gaining? Oh, goodness. Um, I suppose the first thing would be to think less, not to think less of yourself, but to think less about yourself and think more about others. You know, just to, to look out for the people who are struggling, uh, who might need some support in some way and uh, offer that in whatever way you can. You know, we've all got our own um, areas of uh, I wouldn't say expertise uh, experience that might help other people and um, I think that would be um, you know to to try to help people more and not be so much in in our own heads um, I think that's probably the biggest one I would think from okay so that, that, that would require a massive cultural change wouldn't it yes <laughs> um, you know what you're looking for there or what the magic wand would be uh, engaging in is, is a shift in, in the culture um, mm. and obviously you're in the UK and I'm in Australia and yet the things that you're talking about are identical here there's no there's no, mm. there's no difference really and yet many other aspects of culture um, are very different you know from one country to another and you mm. know every right for that to be the case um, I mean look it's been absolutely marvelous is there anything else you wanted to share uh, with the viewers um, I, th I think that for me, the, the best part of, you know, my journey in recovery has been this growing relationship with something 
spiritual uh, and that I accessed that through learning how to meditate I couldn't sit and meditate when I first I couldn't sit still at all and um, I was so I was told well um, go for a walk in the park or go for a walk in the woods you know go and connect with nature and meditate there that's a kind of a meditation so you know you can come I'm not a meditation teacher, but you can come at meditation from lots of different angles, can't you? So, but just being able to sit quietly to accept that um, on, on one hand, I am responsible for everything that I'm, everything I do, um, but I'm not alone in having to make those decisions because I, well, on a physical level, on, you know, on a, an everyday level, I've got my, my friends in the fellowship. I can contact any of them at any time and talk through whatever it is. Um, but I also have a real, a really strong connection with um, something inside of me, uh, which is, you know, my, as I said, my higher power. And that has, um, that's given me a lot of, um, strength hope um and if i only remember to stay connected there it takes away all the fear and uh, everything about, about this situation which pops in all the time you know you know because that's how it is at the moment but i i, I, fi I find i'm able to slow slow down my my sort of um res sort of reactive response to it and and take a breath just like that and and feel better okay well look um the interesting thing that i'm hearing is that um you know all of this stuff is about waking up and um you know actually recognizing the uh, the contrasting and and challenging and you know issues that are around you um, but mm. at the same time um through doing that so in other words through actually facing up to these things and and um taking some breaths and and so on there's tremendous um, support coming and the result is that you're feeling so much better about it. So like I'm hearing all of those things, which is really interesting and it might seem yeah. counterintuitive to people um, that the process of actually confronting is in itself a way of resolving. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it is. It's not something that came naturally. I had to learn how to do it and practice. Um, but then it, it did start to become, and then you start to connect with um, all sorts of other ideas uh, about you, on, on a bigger scale, you know, what is this pandemic actually all about? And there are all sorts of different, um, what's it, interpretations might be the word, um, are out there, you know, from, um, I suppose for about getting on for 10 years now, I, I've felt, you know, I've, I've been reading and, and finding out more about uh, on, on the spiritual side, you know, I've sort of developed that and um, I've been listening and finding out more about a big change coming, you know, um, which I can't talk to many people about because um, they just think, oh, well, you're just being a new age hippie, you know, you're, a, you're an you, either you're an aging hippie or you're a new age hippie mother, <laughs> you know, uh, usually for my kids. Um, but when I start talking about, you know, things about, you know, the planet is um, going through some changes and the planet is ascending and we can't carry on doing what we're doing to the planet, um, you know, and expect it just to go on forever. Uh, but there are, you know, the, there are other um, other levels of beings um, out there who are also there to help and support us. And I mean, there's all sorts of different um, stories going around about things being um, about dark forces being conquered, and it's it's all very metaphorical the language. So it's. Uh, I think it's up to everybody to interpret it as they as they feel best you know suits them. I'm still unsure about a lot of it, but you know they are talking about a big change and that the world's going to shut down and, and there'll be you know I don't know ten days or ten days of darkness or something, and then you know suddenly we're in the situation where oh my god the world's shut down. I didn't think it was going to happen like this, but you know I didn't know how. 
And so you, you, you give more credence to, to these things that you have, that other people have um, received intuitively. That's all I can, that's the best way to, I can put it. I personally haven't received any intuitive messages from any other, um, anything apart from, you know, my own higher power. Um, and that's, it's not on, it's not on the level of information coming in about things, about global things. Um, mine are more personal, but, you know, I, I do accept that this happens because it happened to me. You know, I've had this experience of asking for help and getting it in a way I had no idea about. And so, um, you know, I'm just, uh, it's really interesting that you're, you're doing all this whole series and, you know, thank you to for, for doing it and, and Marianne and the others. Um, so I'm sure it's going to be really helpful to so many people. Um, I'm just waiting to see what next, you know, uh, and try and do my bit however I can, wherever I can. Um, this being one opportunity to do that, I think. <laughs> so thanks. Yeah, no, it's you know, wonderful to, to hear that, like there is that construct of, of what comes and where we're working towards. And obviously, um, you know, your experience with the 12-step program and, and your own personal journey equips you for change and to mm. adapt and, and so on. And, um, you know, it's definitely a process of waking up, you know, that you're engaged in. So I, I'm not too good on crystal balls either um, as to what exactly is going to come. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I'm like you. And, you know, I, I do the same thing that you do, which is I ask myself, and, you know, is, is the direction appropriate? So in other words, what we're doing now or what I'm doing now, is it appropriate? Is it the right thing mm. for me to be doing? And if I get a big yes, well, then I do it. And, yeah. you know, this is the direct experience that you're having from the 12-step process as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's, does this feel right now? Like, is it yes. Can I just also mention, it's just come to me now, that um, I'm also involved in, in something called in it, the intention experiments. Uh, you must have heard of Lynn McTaggart. Yes, I have, yeah. I think, um, and I'm in one of her groups at the moment where and I have I actually took part in the very first intention experiment about oh, it's about 10 years maybe more than 10 years ago possibly um when um uh, and the the idea of it is that it's it's a bit like the Maharishi effect you know group meditation has a positive effect on um local violent crime and all that sort of thing <laughs> So she took that idea and, and made it, you know, has worked with it for the past, uh, probably more than 10 or 15 years to try to positively influence um, various things. And she's, she's, she's a journalist, but she's scientifically trained. So everything she does ha has, you know, scientific backing to it. And it's, um, it's fascinating because um, we're, we're working in small groups and setting intentions for each other and already seeing, you know, some quite remarkable results i don't want to share them in particular but it's worth worth having a look at if anybody's interested in that great right. um, right. well look, thank you for that that tip you know that's um wonderful to hear your personal experience of it and, and so on so look Alan Bandy, thank you so much for talking to me today <laughs> and uh it's been an absolute pleasure to hear your story thank you thanks neil lovely to talk to you too thank you